We understand that the fourth industrial revolution is going to be the game changer in this era. We would now like to have keynote addressed by Professor Ataur Rahman. He is chairman UN Committee on Science and Technology, a PhD in organic chemistry from Cambridge University and a renowned personality. He has won four national civil awards from the government and has been awarded honorary doctorate degrees by many universities. In recognition of his global outstanding services to the development of science and technology, the largest university in Malaysia has established an institution with his name. Please welcome Dr. Atau Rahman on stage. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Very good morning. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about how truth has become stranger than fiction and how every day brings a thousand discoveries, often serendipitous, which are changing our lives in unexpected manners. So it's knowledge which is now the key driver for socio-economic development. Nat natural resources have diminishing importance. And those countries which have realized that their real wealth lies in their children is in the manner in which they educate them and unleash their creative potential. Those are the countries which are marching forward, leaving others far, far behind. So whether it's large countries like China or small countries like Singapore, the story is the same. It's the quality of your human resources and your ability to tap into that creative potential. That is what makes the difference. Singapore, country, population about one-fourth of Karachi. Hardly any natural resources. Exports last year were about 330 billion US dollars. Compare them to Pakistan, about 21 billion dollars, and there is a lesson to be learned from those figures. And what happened in Singapore is highlighted in this slide. The blue line is Singapore per capita, GDP per capita. The red line is UK by comparison. The green line is an average for the rest of the world. So in the mid-1990s, Singapore overtook the UK and has now have got a much higher per capita kingdom, per capita income than many of the advanced European countries. China. This one slide tells you the story of China, how it started preparing itself for the fourth industrial revolution about 50 years ago. So if you look in the, in, sorry, if you look in the first column, uh, starting from 1978, China started sending students. The second column is the number of students sent to top universities abroad. So in 1978, China sent about 860 students, and then the number grew. In 2016, China sent over half a million students abroad to top universities, and about 430 odd thousand students came back after completing their doctorates or postdoctoral training. So every year, about 400 to 450,000 students are coming back to China after training in top universities abroad. They are being clustered in world-class centers of excellence. And two years ago, China had a larger number of publications in nanotechnology, for instance, than the United States. And I predict that in the next 15 years, you'll find US students going to China to study. There's a huge revolution now taking place, this, the knowledge revolution. So let me turn to this strange and wondrous world where innovations, and many of them are so disruptive to ongoing industries, are changing the landscape of, uh, this is not working very well, so it's just, uh, so, yeah. 
So let's turn to my, I've taken a few examples to show you what is going on. For instance, in biotechnology, uh, you find that uh, exciting techniques have been developed where, where, where you can splice a part of a gene and transfer it to the gene of another organism and develop new types of organisms. For instance, some scientists have taken the genes from the firefly, jugnu ke genes liye, and put them into orchids. And lo and behold, you have luminescent orchids which glow in the dark. Golden rice has been developed, which has pro-vitamin A built in. So children which used to die for lack of vitamin A, thousands of, or li of lives are being saved. Uh, malaria is now being tackled by genetically modified mosquitoes uh, so that the females cannot fly away after laying eggs. Can I just uh, give you a signal and you can then change because this seems is not working. At this. So I'll just give you a signal every time. Okay, thank you. Uh, the aging process. A lot of exciting work going on in the field of aging. Can we slow down the process of aging? Can we stop it? Can we reverse it? Well, after all, it's a chemis chemical phenomenon, aging, and many chemical reactions are reversible. And we are now beginning to understand what are the major causes of aging. Well, the apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, every cell has a certain uh, command built into it that it's stop, it's time to die after so many cell divisions, and that's what it does. So scientists have learned how to interfere with that command. Every, at the end of your DNA, there is a protective cap called the telomere, which erodes as you grow older. And the time comes when that, that, that cap is gone and then your DNA itself starts eroding and that's one of the reasons for aging. So scientists have learned how to put that cap on. And there are the, the aging genes and oxygen radicals, hence the antioxidants. So there are many causes. So some exciting developments. Three years ago, David Sinclair at the Harvard Medical School discovered that there was a natural compound called resveratrol. When given to three-year-old mice, it reversed their ages, and they became younger. Their body features changed, and they became like one, one and a half year old. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is another such substance. Uh, metformin uh, is a drug which is already used by FDA, has been approved by FDA for treatment of diabetes, and this has again been found to have very, very interesting anti-aging properties, and clinical trials started last year so uh, on humans uh, for, as an anti-aging compound. So it's predicted that the children being born today will have ages of at least 120 years or more, average ages. In fact, over the last century, we have seen the average age of human beings grow by about three months per year. So people are living longer today by about 20 to 25 years than what they did 100 years ago. But now they are going to be a, a, a huge change in the next 10 years, 15 years, because of these new discoveries that are taking place. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, uh, microbes have been used as workhorses for a long time. And there are all sorts of uh, re changes that are being made in microbial structure so that we can use them to advantage. Is synthetic life around the corner? This is the work of Craig Venter in the USA, where he took a DNA throughout its, uh, throughout its d d DNA and put in a synthetic DNA made in the laboratory, and that came alive and made a billion copies of itself. That happened about two years ago. 3D printing of kidneys, we have just heard. 3D printing of organs. Well, these are, this is now being done. What has been done is that you take a normal inkjet-like printer instrument, and then instead of spraying ink, it sprays human cells on uh, layer by layer, making a part of a liver or a kidney or whatever. The advent of stem cell technologies promises to change the face of medicine. Professor Yamanaka got his Nobel Prize for his work on stem cells. And if you come to my institute in Karachi University, the HEJ Research Institute of Chemistry and the Panjwani Center for Molecular Medicine, you will find a, a very nice stem cell facility. So this is being used for uh, repairing kidneys or damaged kidneys or hearts and so on. So there are lots of exciting work going on there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is part of a 3D printed kidney produced. Next. Cut off a tail of a lizard, it grows back. 
cut off the hand of a person, it doesn't grow back. Why not? Well, they've just discovered that there are certain tiny micro RNA switches which are present in lizards which are activated uh, and allow the organs to grow back. So they are looking now for similar switches in human beings to see if they, are, they exist and if we can similarly trigger them. So the sky is the limit for all these. Uh, so regenerative medicine has come alive and there's a huge amount of work going on in the uh, area of regenerative medicine, tissue gr uh, organ growth using either uh, DNA technologies or stem cell technologies or other aspects of regenerative medicine. Next slide, please. Let's turn now to biology computer interface. Yes, please, next. So quantum computing is coming in in a big way hundreds of millions of times faster than normal computers, working not on the bi normal binary zero-one principle, which normal computers do, but you have working on qubits, and they are perfectly safe, and this is now coming in in a big way, and it's going to change the way uh, business will be done tomorrow, prediction of uh, the environmental changes, uh, the drug, human body interactions, and a variety of other fields. Next slide. The human brain is arguably the most complex object of our universe, 100 billion neurons, each talking to, to some 10,000 other neurons, so 100 billion times 10,000 synaptic connections. Now there are, there are devices which can read your thoughts. For instance, this gentleman has got a, a device around his brain which reads his mental commands. He just gives a mental command to a car, go faster, go slower, stop, go. And, the, and so he can drive through crowded streets purely by mental commands. And, the, and so this is fitted, to, and you can do this now also with completely paralyzed people who cannot even move their fingers, for instance, uh, after a stroke, and they can uh, move a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair, just by thought control. Next slide. The blind can today see with their tongue. Actually, you don't see with your eyes. Eyes are only a mechanism for image transfer. You see with your brain. And so this, uh, this is an electronic lollipop which has been developed, next slide, uh, which this lady has, if you see that uh, this lady has a little camera fitted on her glasses, she's blind, a blind lady. And so the, the images are transferred into this lollipop-like device in her hand which has some 400 sensors. And the moment she puts it on her tongue, the image is transferred through the nervous system of the tongue to the brain, restoring partial eyesight. So this is commercially available, by, made by a company called Vicab in Wisconsin. And uh, now there are other devices. You don't need a lollipop-like device. You can wear an armband and a similar phenomena through the nervous system of the arm, the images can be transferred to the brain. This is an area of great personal interest to me because we have been working on the molecular basis of thought, of memories. Thoughts are not abstract. Thoughts are made of atoms and molecules. What atoms? What molecules? What is the chemistry behind thought storage? So I have published many papers in this area and some of my reviews have been published in top US journals. So those who are interested, I'd be happy to pass them on to you. Next slide, please. Crime genes, genetics. So it has been found that hardened criminals have certain types of genetic changes which makes them much more aggressive, the so-called MAOA gene. And so the time is coming when you, before you employ a person, you'll just have a blood test done and see whether he, does he or she have criminal tendencies. 13 times greater chance to commit a crime than a normal person. Next slide. We just, uh, Ms. Kotwal just mentioned about uh, computers providing medical services. Well, IBM has got two divisions now. One of them is a health division and the other is a legal division. And the health division, uh, you have, you can, uh, there was a competition between cancer specialists last year with IBM's Watson, uh, which is fitted with health software. And in 99% of the cases, Watson came out with the same recipes as cancer specialists had, had suggested. And in 30% of the cases, it came out with additional treatments which the cancer specialists had not suggested. The same thing is happening in the law division. Uh, law students in the U.S. are worried now whether there'll be jobs for them because the, uh, legal companies, law companies, are now using uh, IBM's, Watson's law division services 
to get a very fast uh, uh, advice, a legal advice, uh, at a much cheaper cost than what is provided by lawyers. Next slide. This lady doesn't know a word of Chinese. She's talking to a Chinese gentleman. The gentleman she's talking to doesn't know a word of English. But she's got a little device in her ear. She talks in uh, English. He hears in Chinese, real-time translation. He speaks in Chinese, she hears in English. So these are available. Skype is already doing it for eight languages, but there are now about 40 languages which are, uh, are being developed where you could be able to translate and, uh, and listen to various accents. Next slide. These are devices developed by DARPA. These are s s small insects, uh, insect-like robots, which can be manipulated from miles away, fitted with cameras and sound systems, and they can be made to sit on the wall if you're prime minister or president and transfer all that's going on to the World Bank or to the US ambassador, uh, and everything goes. So next time a flyer comes and sits on your table, watch out. Next slide. So let's now turn to another fascinating area, materials engineering. <coughs> uh, the Harry Potter's disappearing cloak is now a reality. So if Jahan Rasaiwa, if I was to cover you with a shawl made out of metamaterials, you're going to disappear. You're going to be, become invisible to the naked eye. <coughs> May I have the next slide, please? <coughs> so these are uh, metamaterials, M-E-T-A. They bend light around them. So think of a stream of water, hits a stone, and then goes round it. This is what these materials do to light, and they're commercially available. They're being used for cloaking submarines and tanks and other objects. Metamaterials, next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Intelligent materials are here that remember their shape. So you may well be driving a car, car tomorrow, which has a little dent, but then you won't have to worry. You don't have to go to a mechanic or denter. It'll restore itself to its original shape. The Terminator film, you shoot a bullet, a hole is created, and it heals itself. That's now a reality. Self-healing materials are commercially available. Uh, two professors at Manchester University shared a Nobel Prize for their work on graphene. This was 2010. And this is a substance, pure carbon, a honeycomb-like structure, single layer of carbon atoms, 200 times stronger than steel. And it's, f following, it's, it's, it's finding many applications. Next slide, please. It's finding many applications, ranging from paper-thin televisions to shuttling anti-cancer drugs to much more powerful batteries and so on. So amazing substance. And there are other derivatives of graphene which are now available. So this is, the, this is tomorrow, today. And this is where the billions of dollars and cents are. These are the disruptive innovations which are turning present industries upside down. And new opportunities are being created. Next slide. <clears throat> you have a ring wrinkles on your face, don't worry. Just put a little cream on and the wrinkles will magically disappear immediately. Come back in the evening, wash off the cream and the wrinkles reappear. So the wrinkles wrapping cream is here. Next slide. Why do you have to take so many pills every day? Why not one pill which will last you a month? Well, in MIT they have developed this polymeric material which hold on to the drug and release small amounts of the drug as needed throughout a matter of weeks. So this regular taking of pills will also disappear soon. Next slide. Nanotechnology has come in in a big, big way. Uh, this arose rather serendipitously. Uh, some scientists, uh, Croto and Smalley, looking at the chemistry of stars, how, how, how polycyanoacetylenes were formed. And they heated graphite to high temperatures, and lo and behold, they discovered a, an amazing substance called buckyballs. It was a molecular football and it had fantastic properties, 60 carbon atoms. <clears throat> and then the whole field of nanosciences and nanotechnology came alive. So in my center in Karachi University, we have the first national center for nanotechnology which has been built through a donation by Mr. Latif Ibrahim Jamal. And this is finding many, many applications ranging from medicines to water filtration and a host of other applications. Bulletproof paper is here, paper made of nanocellulose, light, absorbent, Bulletproof, made from nanocellulose. Next. 
Paper is now available made from stone. You don't have to cut trees anymore. These are uh, powdered uh, uh, material, powdered stone, uh, combined with a polymer, with uh, a special polymer, and you can make very nice paper out of it. Next slide. The first 3D jet, printed jet engine in Monash, Australia, a couple of years ago. So quite complicated objects that can now be produced by 3D printing. Next slide. Electronic textiles are here. You're wearing a, re an, a red dress and you want a maroon with flowers on it, no problem. You just press a button and the, and the design changes. Commercially available, electronic textiles. You go this evening and you, you look it up on the internet. Want to send an email message? It can be sent from one end of your dupatta. Want to make a telephone call from the other end of the dupatta? So these are electronic textiles available today. Next slide. App textiles, which slowly change their color depending on the chromophore present, the dye that you use. So you may go, go to a party wearing a black dress, come back wearing a maroon one. So they change their color slowly over a period of time, like water ebbs up, up and down. Next slide, please. Energy, let's turn to another area, energy. Next slide. So Tesla, this company was established in 2004. This year, the shares of Tesla were worth more than the shares of Ford, which was established in 1904. And uh, the CEO of Mercedes-Benz in a speech last month said that our real competitor is no longer BMW and other such car manufacturers. Our real competition is with Google and other likes of Google, because that's uh, what is happening in many industries. Next slide. So soon all these cars will be gone that you have in the street. It's been predicted that you will have uh, uh, cars wor working on purely electric cars. Next slide, please. Uh, energy can now be produced from cellulose. Uh, this is, cellulose is abundant. The grass outside is cellulose. Your shirt is probably cellulose. So cellulose has now been converted by a microorganism into butanol and isobutanol. And what's so interesting about butanol, it can be used 100% as car fuel, whereas ethyl alcohol, ethanol, can only go to about 25 or 30% before you need to change the engine. So this is uh, now cellulose being converted into fuel. Next, ne next slide, please. Well, let me now turn to a little bit of how, what uh, some of the steps that I took to help Pakistan try to start entering into the fourth industrial revolution when I was the minister for science and later the minister responsible for higher education and also for IT and telecom. Uh, I persuaded President Musharraf at the time to, to give a 6,000% increase in the development budget for science and technology in Pakistan and later also 3,500% increase in the development budget for higher education. Uh, uh, and I said, because we have to put our money into our children, so let's stop looking for aid from outside. Just buy one or two less F-16s and put the money into education. Next slide, please. And we focused on high-quality faculty, because universities are not about beautiful buildings. They are about beautiful minds. The single biggest factor which determines quality in an institution is the quality of its faculty. So we sent about 11,000 students abroad to top universities across the world. And in order to attract them back, we changed, tried to change the ecosystem, the environment here, by raising salaries. So the salary of a professor became about four times the salary of a federal minister in the government. Uh, but this was a contractual system. Paying high salaries to weak people would just have been a waste of money. So a new contractual system was introduced nationwide, first evaluation after three years, then after six years, before you won tenure. Every student coming back, he, could, he or she could apply for a $100,000 research grant one year before uh, returning, so that even if they came back to a weak university, they would have sufficient research funding. Created a digital library, which today provides free access to 65,000 textbooks from 220 international publishers and to 25,000 international journals with back volumes. We probably were the first in the world to have an open access instrumentation system in Pakistan. What is that? You may have heard of open access journals, but this is open access instrumentation, which means that any researcher 
can send his samples for analysis to any institution of his choice in the country. The analysis would be done free of charge for him uh, within 72 hours, but he can send a, uh, the, his institution, the institution providing the analysis can send a bill to the Higher Education Commission for payment. So it will be paid for by the HEC. So existing resources would be optimized that way. And these and some many other measures that we took uh, had uh, amazing results. Next slide, please. A lot of number of other steps were taken, such as ranking of universities, tax reductions, and etc. I don't have time to go into them. Next slide, please. And uh, this is what happened. The PhD output shot up and continues to increase. So this is, uh, you see 2002 was, was when the Higher Education Commission was established. We were producing only about 100, 150 PhDs from the whole of Pakistan at that time. Now we are producing somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000. But numbers with, without quality would be a disaster. So we insisted that every thesis has to go to top international experts abroad for evaluation before the doctorates can be awarded. And of course, everything is checked through for plagiarism, through Authenticate and other softwares. Next slide. And the research publication shot up from Pakistan in, in quality journals. We are publishing only 700 publications in international journals back in 2002. Now we have, last year we published about 12,000 papers in top international journals, and Pakistan is now at par or slightly ahead of India in terms of research publications per million population. We were about 15 times behind on the same yardstick uh, 15 years ago. So something quite dramatic has happened in Pakistan. Next slide. And by the time I, in 2008, when I resigned as the chairman HEC and left, we had uh, several of our universities ranked among the 250, 300, 350 of the world by the Higher Education Times UK rankings. Unfortunately, this support was not sustained subsequently, and now we have slid back. We have only one university right at the bottom of the last 500. The rest have all slipped out of the international rankings. Next slide. Uh, this is the PERN, Pakistan Educational Research Network, which was set up and which links all the universities with higher quality internet. And, uh, which has, and on this we have the digital library which is functioning. Next slide. And uh, established video conferencing facilities across in all the universities and we have daily lectures from top universities from across the world. We are probably one of the best connected uh, university systems in this sense, and this is something that I had set up at that time. So I have, this is a program which is still running under my supervision. We have had 4,000 lectures in the last five years. So on an average, three lectures a day from top universities. There is a focal point in every university of Pakistan. They are informed a month in advance who is going to talk from where, on which subjects, so the relevant departments are informed. And these are interactive. So this is a very nice program which has been running uh, for the last uh, decade or so. Next slide, please. And we placed Pakistan's first satellite also on space. Part of it was set aside for education. The virtual university uh, transponder was set aside for distance education at that time. Next slide. Uh, mobile telephony uh, was one of the areas uh, where, which expanded very fast. We had only 300,000 mobile phones, 0.3 million at that time. And we did two things. Firstly, introduced U-phone at much lower prices, so to create market competition. And second was people had to pay for receiving a call, so I switched that. And I said, no, it should be the calling party which should pay and not the person receiving, because the common person was reluctant to have a mobile phone, call koi kar rahe, or paise hamari jeb se ja rahe. So that was a huge psychological barrier. And since then, you have an explosive expansion. So at almost zero cost to the government, we have had now it's 150 or 160 mobile, million mobile phones in Pakistan. Next slide. Uh, Jahan Ara is here. Well, uh, uh, this was an article published in the New York Times on the 10th of August uh, of 2015. And uh, it said uh, that uh, from $30 million in the year 2000, the IT business has considerably expanded. Now I believe it is about $3 billion or $3.2 billion uh, presently, so more than a hundredfold expansion. And uh, that uh, it also said that Pakistani programmers now rank as number three in the world with annual sales of $850 million. So we are almost, we are close to a billion dollars just by these young people making apps and selling them. So something again very interesting is happening in that area. Next slide. Okay. 
uh, the chairman of the United Nations Commission for Science, Technology and Development uh, had this to say in a report that he published that in no other country has the higher education sector seen such spectacular positive de developments as Pakistan during the last six years. He, this was published in 2008. And Thomson Reuters, which is the world's leading international uh, data, scientific data and ranking uh, agency, uh, published a report on Pakistan in 2016, last year, heading another brick in the wall, BRIC. And it compared the highly cited publications coming out from Pakistan with those from Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And it concluded that Pakistan has emerged as a country with the highest percentage of highly cited papers compared with the BRIC countries. So the delta, the actual numbers, of course, are lower, but there's something very exciting going on in terms of high quality research from some selected laboratories across the country. So at the highest level, we are really something very good is happening. So this is what is preparing us for the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is a revolution of the mind. It's a revolution based on knowledge. It's a revolution based on creativity. And for that, you have to invest in education, education at all levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and higher. Next slide, please. And all this that was going on, India became concerned. And there was a detailed presentation made to the Indian Prime Minister on the 22nd of July, 2006, about Pakistan and what I was trying to do and about the Higher Education Commission. And India uh, then, uh, this was published in the Hindustan Times on 23rd July under the heading Pakistan Park Threat to Indian Science. And they decided to close down their UGC at, as Pakistan had done and form an organization just like the HEC. Uh, this was approved by the cabinet, Indian cabinet. Uh, the new organization was called National Commission for Higher Education and Research, NCHR but it was not approved by their Lok Sabha, so their UGC continues. Next slide, please. Well, this is, I'm just coming to the last two or three slides. Next slide. Well, this is a new type of books that I have started. Uh, well, this is first about MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. These are available from Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Khan Academy. What we've done is downloaded all of them, put them onto one platform with their permission, of course. And from school level to university level, they are freely available at this website, legforlearning.com.pk. So these are tens of thousands of courses which are freely available to everybody. And we have distributed them to universities so that they can make use of these courses from the top universities across the world. Next slide, please. And these are new types of books that I've come forward with. These are books without any text, formal text. Uh, just the headings are in text. And this is, uh, book was, uh, has a foreword from the French Nobel laureate, Jean-Marie Lane. Uh, what I've done is I've put them video links in it to lectures by the world's top professors. So it covers the entire curriculum of organic chemistry, but you just click and start learning from the best in the world. So I've also come out with another book on molecular biology in a similar manner. Next slide, please. And we have lectures going on across Pakistan uh, of various types. We have interactive Chinese, German, French, and Arabic teaching also going on. This is again being uh, done for my center uh, in Karachi. Next slide, please. So I'll end here by just saying that we live in this knowledge-driven world, and some of the no innovations are just a flash in the pan. There's so much going on that in every field that truth has really become stranger than fiction. And the way forward for Pakistan is to invest in the 100 million or so of young people that we have, 100 million below the age of 20. That is the real resource of Pakistan. And the moment that we have leadership that realizes that they are our real wealth and start investing in uh, science and innovation, how far have we fallen behind? Cambridge University, where I am an honorary life professor, 9 0, 90 Nobel Prizes from one university, 32 Nobel Prizes from Trinity College, Cambridge, just one college, 32 Nobel Prizes, not a single Nobel Prize from anywhere in the Islamic world for work done within the Islamic world. Score is zero. That's how far we have fallen behind. So it's time to wake up and start investing in our children. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.